Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lucas, uh, for making time. You are in between racing in Berlin and Monaco, so he's squeezing us in between some auto racing. Uh, for those who don't know, Formula E, which Lucas helped to create, it's, it's an all-electric version of kind of Formula One, so open-wheel cars, tight turns, the whole thing. Um, and I wanted to talk with you first about that, uh, how you went from racing combustion engine cars to racing uh, electric vehicles and how you helped to create this circuit in the first place, the Don of Sport. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Thanks for your time. Formula E, for people that uh, it's not familiar with motorsport, it's the same as uh, any other racing series, but we started it in 2012 with the um, with the idea of creating a battery, uh, battery-powered electric car to race, to accelerate the development of technologies that you'll see in commercial vehicles uh, in the future. So back in 2012, nobody was really talking about electric cars, or only a few people talking about the future of electric, but we saw that as an opportunity to create um, what motorsport has been doing for the past decades, which is to develop actually relevant technologies that we'll see in commercial applications. But not, not only that, also try to change, in a way, people's perception of electric car. So if you see a fast electric car racing around the track, you see that the car is exciting, the car is sexy, you're probably, when you, you have a higher likelihood of buying an electric car when you're going to purchase your next vehicle. So that was the core principle of creating Formula E. And that happened because back then I was in Formula One, and in Formula One, they were already talking about hybrid engines. It was the first year when I was racing that they were starting to talk about efficiency, about uh, electrification. And the clear next step was to come up with a full electric series. And that's how Formula E was created. And that's how um, my career shifted quite a lot because um, after that I raced in uh, hybrid cars. And then uh, now for the past nine years I've been racing Formula E. I want to go a little bit into, well, speaking of, of sexy hybrid cars, I drive a Chrysler Pacifica hybrid minivan. Um, and so I know a little bit, I've driven EVs, I know what it's like, the difference between a gas car and an EV. I can go zero to 60 in a little under two hours, usually. But, um, but I wonder, for a race car driver, that's a big transition. Uh, and if what that experience is like behind the wheel with the EV versus the, the traditional gas race car. It is a very different experience. Um, there was the personal experience and, of course, the technique of driving the car fast. The, um, I think the most, the most personal experience, the, the difference between driving an electric car is that it's quiet. So for the purists, the first question I get for the past 10 years is that, oh, you drive an electric, car race, uh, uh, an electric race car, don't you miss the sound? And I was like, yeah, kind of missed the sound, but it's, it's not what actually makes the car go fast. It's not mm -hmm. the sound. Um, and you can hear the crowd. So in some races, if you are in a slow corner and everything is, you can hear the suspension moving, you can hear the tire, and you can hear the crowd. And in motorsport, you'll never be able to hear the crowd, of course, because the engine is so loud. So this experience changed a lot uh, my relation. But... Uh, to, to electric racing, but also in the terms of the technique, the car has so much torque. We have now the generation three Formula E car, we are on the third generation car. It has two motors, one in the front, one in the back. Uh, the front motor has 350 horsepower, the one in the back has 450 horsepower, and the motor is this size. It's 20 kilos heavy, so you can put four motors and have 1,800 horsepower very easily in the car. It's just a matter of a decision. It has, we have only one gear. The car goes, the car goes from zero to 190, 200 miles per hour with a single gear. The engine is 97% efficient through, and it's not, when you say 97, oh, okay, that's maybe, but it's through the whole range of the RPM. You don't need a gear, you don't need gearbox, you don't need oil. And if, when you reach 97% efficiency, it's so, so high 
that almost don't need cooling anymore mm -hmm. because only 3% of the energy is dissipated as heat. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big leap. And of course, the bottleneck are the batteries. Right. Batteries are heavy. The batteries, they don't last long. Uh, but the technology is evolving a lot. In the first year of Formula E, we had two cars because we couldn't do the race with a single car. <laughs> True story. You can look at YouTube. So they made us jump from one car to another on the pit stop. I thought that was insane. Actually, it was insane. Uh, I got a lot of bruises because I need to jump out of the car. So it's stopping the pit stop. Instead of the mechanics changing the wheel, you had to jump from one car to another. And uh, in eight seconds, get belted in and drive off. Um, and then generation two, battery was big enough or energy dense enough that you could drive the whole race. And Gen 3 now has more or less one kilo per horsepower. The car can accelerate in less than two seconds. Uh, it's, a, it's a big leap forward. Right. Now that noise question, I, I love that because I once wrote a piece about guys who drag race Teslas against gas cars like in North Carolina and watching people encounter that for the first time when it just launches silently. Yeah, the, the torque is instant, yeah. right? Uh, it's different from a combustion car. Right, yeah. But the tech transfer piece that you mentioned, I want to go back to because I think that's really interesting. We've seen this for decades in the automotive industry, disc brakes, independent suspension, all this stuff that is in cars now that everyday people drive started out in race cars. How, how are we seeing that already beginning to happen with electric vehicles borrowing from what you are doing in Formula E? Um, yeah, so the, the, there is many different technologies that we are actually racing now that you guys will see on the road in the next few years. Uh, the motor, as I just uh, said, uh, reaches a certain efficiency level that will increase range by maybe 5 to 10 percent in the near future. Um, the fast charging, mm -hmm. our batteries are capable of charging at 600 kilowatts, which means that when you it means two things. So in the racing, during the race, we don't use mechanical brakes. So the car has no brakes at the rear. There is no discs. There's no brakes at all. And in the front, we have a safety brakes, which uh, are only used in qualifying. But in the race, 100, actually 100% 100 of the potential usable energy that the car is actually at speed is recuperated into the battery. So when you brake, you recuperate all that energy. You have no uh, wear on the disc. There is no brakes, all magnetic brakes. The, the, the capacity of charging is 93%, which also is like almost twice as much as some of the vehicles we have there. And that means that you can actually fast charge the car with a charger at 600 kilowatts, which, mean in a, which means in a conventional vehicle, you'll be able to charge your car in maybe five minutes, full battery. Uh, so these technologies are being try, tried out in, a, mm -hmm. in the racing, and then we will see that in the future very soon. Right. And the other piece you mentioned is a common sort of one for sport across the board of just changing perceptions, changing awareness. I mean, we look at sports, you know, um, football, soccer, there's talk about these events like the World Cup, they're hugely emissive and in a way unnecessary, right? But they also are these huge platforms for athletes to talk about what matters to them and, and maybe cause change. In this case, it's a really, you're, you're, you're pr practicing the thing that you're asking people to change in a way, right? So how does the sort of public awareness piece work with Formula E? How do you, who are you reaching and, and, and what is the message that you're bringing? Yeah, um, motorsport is a unique sport because you're developing the technology in parallel with awareness. So at the same time the technology evolves, those technologies we just talked about, also you have big reach and you can promote this technology, you can promote the, 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 the electric vehicle, you can promote um, the message that you want to, to pass to the fans. Other sports they don't do that, like which technology, I don't know, football right. developed, uh, pretty much, I don't think none, that is, uh, that goes directly from the pitch to the uh, to our daily lives, but of course the awareness of the, mm. the sports people and uh, some celebrities are very important to transmit the message, considering the message is a good one, yeah. Right. <laughs> and you are not off the track, you are also involved in clean air initiatives for the UN, and we were talking a little bit about how 
that piece of emissions sometimes gets overlooked, that you're talking about just pollution, and that with electric vehicles versus traditional combustion engines, but really any e-fuel, there's an important difference that you think sort of is decisive. I wonder if you could sort of talk about that. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of talk about different fuels, who's going to, uh, what's going to be the next, uh, let's say, uh, technology that is going to be used. And my work with the UN uh, started in 2017. And the message I want to use, that I want to, um, together with UN, to, to put forward is that electric cars, they contribute, if any, a very little amount to climate change as a whole. Of course, it's something positive. Depends your energy matrix, depends how you produce your energy. There is a lot of nuances we can discuss for three hours, the full cycle of production of the vehicle, only the mileage, the emissions here or there. But what we cannot ignore, and is much more important, is air pollution. We are here in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, I'm from Sao Paulo. I've been to Delhi. I've been to Mexico City. The amount of hours, days, maybe months lost uh, due to air uh, in, in lifespan, due to, uh, to air pollution, is huge. And electric cars, they cut that. You can have a biofuel car. You can have an e-fuel car. But, I mean, they pollute in the same way. Maybe they are carbon neutral, but if you are, if you, if you are behind, if you are, if you lock yourself in a garage, like we discussed, if you lock yourself in a garage and you turn on your biofuel car, you die the same way right. as, a, as a normal car. So electric vehicles, they reduce drastically, well, they, they emit zero pollution. So the air quality that we're talking about will improve massively the lives of people worldwide, especially in dense packed cities. So definitely powered electric, uh, battery powered electric cars in those cities uh, are going to be the future. Right. Not biofuel, not e-fuels, um, not hydrogen for private cars. Right. Were there questions from the... We have just a little time left. Check in. One here. Ah, oh, there we are. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, he asked basically whether Formula One would ever go electric. Yeah, Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, what's going to happen with these categories? If right. you know, the future of cars are electric. And I think that there is only two scenarios. Um, if they want to stay relevant to commercial vehicles, they will have to go electric at one point. Or they don't. They become a pure entertainment platform. They focus on other technologies. They can focus, for example, in light construction techniques. They can focus on uh, e-fuels. E-fuels are going to be used, yes, in aviation, most likely. One way to decarbonize the aviation industry is not electrifying aviation. It would be most likely to put e-fuels. Um, so you could use some of these technology that you develop, technologies that you develop in a Formula One car, in a combustion engine, to kind of transfer to a different industry. Um, but it's, it's a decision that they have to make. But from our, from our perspective, from Formula E, the new fans, the, the older generation, I would say even my generation, they are very attached to the sound and to combustion. It's something that is, you grew up with. But the new generation, they almost don't care. And if we do a good job with Formula E, um, it will create the new audience that will uh, be agnostic about how the car is, uh, is powered. Very good. Was there any? I think we have maybe one more here. Yes. That's, that's a great question. So basically, too, um, what's the difference between pollution and climate change and how, to, how electric cars can help with that? So if you take all passenger cars worldwide, it represents about 3 to 4% carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions. 
Uh, so if all of them go electric, and the energy production to charge those cars are also fully renewable. We're talking about a mitigation of 3 to 4%, uh, not including the process of building those cars. So it is relevant, it is, for climate change, do we need electric cars to be 100% or to be net zero in the future? We need electric cars. But we're talking about UN estimates about uh, 4 to 5 million deaths a year prematurely due to air pollution. And Air pollution is not binary. You don't have or you don't have. There is air pollution everywhere. It's just a matter of how much. Like you said, I've been to Delhi. I've been, I did a documentary on air pollution there. And some point it gets 999. The sensor went to the, through the roof, really. And stops, goes to the maximum. And that, I went to hospitals. I spoke to doctors. Uh, the situation is critical. There are millions and millions of people that are suffering with chronic respiratory disease because of air pollution. It's all caused by cars, no. But cars are a massive contributor to that. And here, I guess, is one of the main ones. So even if Manhattan, for example, has a, a lower AQI than Delhi or Sao Paulo, still, your quality of life and your kids, they will be better off if all the cars here are electric. You're, you're riding your bicycle from here to another place you want to go, you'll be healthier by not, uh, rest, um, by not uh, inhaling those harmful gases. So if we have the technology, we have the, the capacity to do that, we should do it. And then there is the nuances of how the energy is produced. If the energy is produced by fossil fuels, they are, they are um, basically, they could be mitigated because it's, it's in a single place, so it's already better. But they, the carbon emissions, they stay there. Um, so it depends on how the energy is done. For example, in Brazil, Brazil, the energy matrix is 80% renewable. So an electric car in Brazil is actually electric. But an electric car in China, maybe, or in other places which the matrix is very coal-based, even Germany now, uh, with maybe even with gas, it's not purely electric. Of course, there is emissions from the energy grid. Good. Um, we have to wrap. I could go all day, but we're <laughs> out of time. I apologize. Uh, this has been fascinating, and I really appreciate you making the time. Thanks, Dara. Thank you very much.